hi there. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming, and thank you very much for watching. My name is Cameron Hewitt, and I love to incorporate food in my travels around Europe. And let me explain to you why by way of a story. I'm going to go for a walk with you through one of my favorite hill towns in Tuscany, a town called Monte Pulciano. This is an adorable little hill town where you are on the main square and walk with me downhill just a couple of blocks on a cobbled lane, and suddenly you come across a perfect little trattoria. And you step inside, it's one of these places where the second you walk inside, you know this is a really special place, right? Um, people are having a great meal. And then in the back, up a few steps, you see the owner, Julio. And he's hacking giant chunks of beef uh, that he's serving out to people as they order. You take a table, and Julio comes to your table. And he says, what do you want? And you say, we want the steak, OK? Julio goes to his cleaver, and he hacks off a big chunk of steak. And then he puts it on a piece of paper, and he brings it to your table. He says, is this OK? And you say, yeah, you bet it's OK, sure. <laughs> so Julio disappears up into the kitchen for a few minutes. And then they bring out some of the most delicious pastas that you've ever had. And just when you think you can't possibly eat anymore, Julio comes back with this fantastic chunk of steak. He doesn't ask you how do you want it done. Julio knows how it's done, OK? This is Kianina beef, top quality Tuscan beef that was uh, sourced just a few miles away. How it's done is a little bit of coarse salt Seven minutes on one side, seven minutes on the other side. If you don't like it rare, you can go to the place down the street, right? <laughs> you look at this steak and you think, there is no way after having all that pasta, I can also eat this enormous steak. And yet, somehow, you manage. <laughs> you can understand why I think food is one of the great joys of travel. Uh, my name is Cameron Hewitt. I've been working with Rick Steves since the year 2000. I wear a lot of hats uh, around the office. And I also get to travel about three months a year. Most of the time when I'm in Europe, I'm researching our guidebooks. I'm the co-author of a few of our guidebooks and a contributor to several others. I've done guidebook work in probably 30 or 40 different countries. And no matter where I go, I'm just captivated and fascinated by how Europe uh, involves food in their culture. It's, it's something that's fun. It's something that's hedonistic. But it's also more than that. Uh, it can tell you a lot about uh, interesting places. Uh, and I want to talk for one thing about this word foodie. The title of this class is Europe for Foodies. It's taken me a while to kind of embrace this word foodies. Foodies is kind of a, I think, a little bit of a silly word. It sounds kind of pretentious. But I've decided I'm going to kind of grab this word with gusto and really make it my own. Uh, being a foodie is simply somebody who prioritizes food in your life, and especially food in your travels. It's somebody who sees the value in food. It's somebody uh, who doesn't just eat to live. You live to eat. Uh, and that's the way that I live my life, and that's the way that I travel. This talk is a little bit about what that means in practice in Europe. I want to talk about why food matters. I want to talk about what you should eat in Europe and where you should eat those things. And I want to talk about how you can incorporate food into your travels. Now, I've talked already a little bit about sort of the sensory experience of having great food in Europe, the hedonism of delicious food. But I think uh, what's really interesting to me, what's really exciting to me, there are opportunities to use food to stimulate your brain as well. Um, so I'm going to challenge you to always look at food through the lens of culture. What can the food tell you about the culture, and vice versa? Uh, and you'll see all of my examples throughout this talk. You'll notice that's sort of a running, a running current. There's delicious food, but there's always a story behind the delicious food. For example, let's, let's start off with a word association game. Finish this sentence. Swiss? Cheese. Swiss cheese, right? This is a country that is 100% associated with a very specific food product, Swiss cheese. Everybody in the world knows what Swiss cheese is. It's these giant wheels of mountain cheese with big bubbles inside. Uh, and the Swiss people are very proud of the fact that people know them for their cheese. There's a whole culture around Swiss cheese making and raising cows. And if you go to Switzerland, you'll find that the government actually subsidizes cheese making. Uh, every spring, a bunch of cowhands and cheese makers parade their cows from the low pastures up into the high mountains. And they camp out all summer long at the scalps of the Alps. And they live in little huts. And they hang the ceremonial cow bells from the eaves. And the cow hens have to get up every morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, rain or shine, doesn't matter how tired you are, those cows have to be milked. And every single day, they have to make the cheese in the afternoon. And after about 100 days of that, when the weather starts to change, the cows come back from the high mountains down into the pastures. And you never know what it's going to happen. But I've actually been in Switzerland, fortunately, a couple of times in late September where suddenly you're in a little village and you hear this clanging chorus of cowbells coming down the street. And that's the sign that the cows are coming back down to pasture. And you look up, and it's this proud celebration of Swiss culture. It's something that's really inspiring. Uh, and not to put too much uh, of a fine point onto it, but of course, this is an example of how food and culture are so very much intertwined. All of this Swiss cheese also makes up some of the greatest uh, Swiss culinary treats, uh, cheese fondue, raclette, 
even Swiss chocolate, if you had a Swiss association word game, the other word you might have thought of is chocolate. Of course, Swiss chocolate is distinguished by being very milky, creamy chocolate from those same cows. And let me give you another example of the way that uh, culture and cuisine are very much tied together, as they are with landscape, as they are with climate. It all is part of the same piece. Let's talk about Spain. One thing that Spain is famous for, if you've ever been to Spain in the summer, you know it has a blazing hot climate. This is not a place where you want to be out at midday in the hot sun. In fact, people organize their entire lives around being out of the hot summer sun in the middle of the day. Then what happens in the evening, as the sun sinks low and it's finally cool enough to go out and wander around, people get out into the streets and they wander up and down these pedestrian streets. It's this beautiful Spanish custom called the paseo that you might have heard of. Uh, and it's, it's a celebration of life, it's a social event, people bump into their neighbors, their relatives, their friends. Now this obviously uh, is an important part of Spanish culture and Spanish custom, but it ties directly into Spanish cuisine and cooking and food. What, when we think of food, is the thing that you think of in Spain? Tapas, right? Tapas culture, small plates. Well that ties perfectly into this lifestyle that they've created around this blazing hot climate. Uh, when Spaniards are out walking, they don't, the last thing they want to do is to go into a restaurant and sit at a table for an hour and a half and have a full meal. They've been crammed in their apartments all day long trying to avoid the heat. No, they want to be able to wander into a bar, pick up a few little dishes, wander uh, up the street to another bar, bump into some other friends, then go to the next bar and get a few other dishes. That's why Spain is famous for its tapas culture. Um, these are just examples of the way that you can think about food beyond just food, but also as, as culinary uh, education and cultural education. And there's also fun little customs with all of these food uh, customs as well. For example, in Spain, when you're finished with your garbage at the tapas bar, you just literally drop it on the floor. That's considered sanitary, because the last thing you want to do with a dirty napkin is put it on the counter where all the food is, right? This seems kind of uh, rude to us, but it actually makes a lot of sense in the Spanish way of looking at things. Uh, I took a cooking class once in Tuscany with a wonderful chef named Marta, and she taught me how to make the most delicious Italian uh, tomato sauce that I've ever made. And she stressed to me how important it was how simple this sauce was. It has five ingredients, tomatoes, olive oil, garlic, salt, and a little bit of red pepper flakes for a little bit of spice. That's all it takes, and it's delicious. It makes everything that you put on it absolutely delicious. Now, uh, in contrast to that, let's look at France. I took a great cooking class once in France in Burgundy, which is a very food-focused region of France, and it was the exact opposite. It was all about complexity. It was almost like how many different ingredients can we put on this plate? How complicated a technique can we use to make this work? French chefs uh, are not just slamming a bunch of beautiful produce on a plate and saying, there's your dish. They take pride in being technicians. They take pride in their technique, in being innovators, in coming up with creative and interesting ways to present food. They use the word compose, composé a lot in French. Dishes are composed. Our uh, chefs think of themselves almost more as artists than they do as, as culinary technicians. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about France is when you're really that technically adept, and when you have chefs that like to rise to a challenge, the French have a knack for turning inedible things into really delicious foods. <laughs> Think about escargot, which is maybe the most kind of stereotypical French food. It's literally snails that are simmered in butter and garlic. Somebody had to have the idea, you know, you see those snails crawling around over there, I wonder what we could do to make those delicious. <laughs> and this applies to a lot of very famous French dishes. Coco van uh, is rooster in a red wine sauce. Nobody eats a rooster. Rooster is a very tough, gamey meat. Chefs in France figured out a way to make it absolutely delicious. Beef bourguignon is a very similar concept. Uh, duck confit. This is a duck that's been preserved in its own fat and put in a can as long as you need it to be put in a can. And then you open it up and you cook it in that same fat. And it's really absolutely delicious. Uh, this is a really impressive feat of engineering for French people. Uh, Italians would say, why are you making it so complicated? Just put delicious things on a plate and people will enjoy it. Uh, so I'm just challenging you when you travel to think about kind of the larger themes and the cuisines uh, of the places that you're going to. I want to talk a little bit about European foodie concepts. What's really interesting to me is a lot of the things that are trendy in a today's American foodie world are coming directly from European culture. And in a lot of cases, they're very, very old aspects of European culture. They're nothing new to Europeans. And today, they're very trendy. Here's an example. Europeans embrace this concept called terroir. It comes from the French word la terre, the land. And it basically means that the qualities of food, the qualities uh, of certain ingredients are deeply rooted in the very specific place where it's grown. So if you go to Burgundy, the vineyards of Burgundy in France, and you look at these vineyards, somebody who's a purist in France would say the wine that is grown on the left slopes in this picture will have subtly but importantly different qualities than the wine on the right slope of this same valley. 
Uh, they really believe that food is rooted that specifically to the place where it's grown. This sounds kind of familiar to current American foodies. We use terms like locally sourced, farm to table. European foodies talk really in a trendy way these days about zero kilometer. It's the idea that the best food is food that's produced within less than a kilometer of the place where it's eaten. I went to a farm in Tuscany once and they were very proud to serve me a zero kilometer meal where I had prosciutto and pecorino cheese and wine and olive oil and every bit of what was on the table was produced within less than a kilometer of that place. What's interesting to me about some of these concepts that are so trendy these days is they are sort of accidentally foodie places all over Europe. Some of the most rustic and remote corners of Europe do these things sort of as, as a, a sense of necessity, not necessarily because they're trying to be trendy or foodie. Uh, I went to a very remote corner of Romania where I visited a very, very humble goat farm. And you see these guys hunching down a couple of times a day. They have, to, they have to milk their flock of goats. And then they walk across the field to a little shed where I watched them literally hand form cheese right before my eyes. And then we pulled up some chairs at a table and had some of the cheese that they had just made. And I thought, geez, it doesn't get more farm to table than that, right? <laughs> there's the farm and there's the table. And my point is that all the things that uh, I think American foodies, American chefs sort of strive for are something that is very much integral to the European food DNA. This is just something that they do naturally, and in some cases, purely out of necessity. Another thing very important to Europeans is it's important to eat with the seasons. If you go to a place that produces a lot of truffles, for example, northern Croatia, and you try to get white truffles outside of the season, some places will sell them to you, but they're going to be preserved. And any pr truffle pur purist will say, if you want to get white truffles, you have to go starting in late September, and you can only get them through November. That's when they're fresh. That's when they're straight out of the ground. And if you don't get them at the right time, you're going to get something that's been preserved and won't have the same flavor. Uh, this is very important to Europeans who care about food. You don't want to go to Paris in the summer looking for French onion soup, because French onion soup is a winter dish uh, for Parisians. This is a big bonus uh, in terms of finding and discovering some great foods that you wouldn't have otherwise tried. I was in <coughs> Tuscany once in November, and I noticed that the spindly branches of all of these trees around the Tuscan uh, countryside were heavy with big, fat, ripe persimmons. And then I went to a restaurant where they served me an amazing dessert of pureed persimmons with chestnut mousse. All ingredients that were very much in season at that moment. And it was a sense of, uh, this was not necessarily a dessert that I crave all the time, but it was the perfect dessert for that place and for that time. Italians brag, if you show me a menu by a good chef, I can tell you not only what part of Italy that menu is from, but what season it's from. Uh, because Italians and a lot of Europeans really focus on seasonality of food. In fact, in Italy, it's illegal to have frozen ingredients in your food unless you say on the menu this, this dish has frozen ingredients. That's how carefully they take this sort of thing. Another thing I want to encourage you to do is learn about local specialties, but go beyond the cliches, not just the basic local specialties. Become a connoisseur in the local specialties. If you go to Spain, you might know already that one of the classic dishes of Spain, I would say it's sort of the staple of the Spanish diet, is jamón, which is an air-cured ham. It's a little bit like Italian prosciutto. Uh, if I go to the supermarket in the United States, to the, dairy, the deli case, they might have one kind of prosciutto. If you go to Spain, there is a whole rainbow of prosciutto. There are so many different kinds of uh, prosciutto, or jamón, as they call it. In fact, a Spaniard will say, well, there's jamón, but if you want the really best jamón, it has to be jamón ibérico de bellota. This is the jamón made from black-footed pigs who graze and free-range, eating only acorns in the area between Madrid and Portugal. And this jamón is completely different from any other jamón you're going to have, and it's worth paying double for. Uh, that sounds a little crazy to us, but become a connoisseur of the places, of the foods in the places that you go. It's really important and a great way to uh, connect with those cultures. Look at pastas in Italy. Of course, when we think of Italy, we think of pasta. Have you ever been to one of those restaurants where you walk in and there's a menu and it says, you can choose any of the noodles from this half of the menu and any of the sauces from this half of the menu, and we'll throw them together and make it for you. Is this familiar to you? You did not go to that restaurant in Italy. Italians would never do this. Uh, Italians have hundreds of different kinds of noodles, and each one is specifically engineered to highlight the sauce or the other ingredients that go with it. And it's really fun to kind of geek out on this a little bit, get to know. Now, why is it that they do spaghetti always with clams? It's because an Italian chef knows that the spaghetti is the perfect noodle for conveying the flavors of the clam and the sauce of the clams. Um, I love to go to the Cinque Terre on the Italian Riviera. And there's two things that you'll have there. One is pesto, this uh, absolutely delicious paste uh, that's made of pine nuts and garlic. Um, and they always serve it with a very special kind of noodle called trofie. 
Why Trofia is special is it's designed to be a really thick, chewy little twist. It's got a little spin to it, and it's designed to kind of pick up all of that pesto on its way from the plate to your mouth. Italians would think it was crazy to eat pesto with anything other than trofia, especially Italians in this part of the country. There's a whole world of great pastas in Italy that go beyond spaghetti and meatballs, and it can be really fun to learn about these and to understand uh, why they exist in that place and what the pasta is designed to accomplish. There's a whole similar world of cheeses in France, for example. If you want to become a cheese aficionado, France is the place, and it's the same idea there. I also would encourage you not just to look at sort of big national or regional specialties, but really drill down to very specific local specialties. Uh, this is a deep fried artichoke, uh, which is very specifically the dish, not of the city of Rome, but of the Jewish ghetto in the city of Rome. Uh, and that's how specific Europeans get with their specialties. It, it's right down to a neighborhood sometimes, and it's fun to discover what that is in uh, I think the only place I've ever had this was in the Jewish ghetto in Rome, and it was the perfect place to have it for that reason. If you're walking along the beach in Portugal, you see all of the fishermen's boats all pulled up onto the beach. And nearby, you start to smell it before you see it, but there are a bunch of racks of little fish, the day's catch, that are all sort of crucified and laid out to dry in the sun. Uh, and this is a good reminder that Portugal has a very strong tradition for sardines and other kinds of preserved fish. This is segueing into my next topic, which is be adventurous. It's easy to get excited about pasta. It's easy to get excited about cheese, maybe. Might be a little harder to get excited about sardines, but I make a point to be a cultural chameleon. If I'm in Portugal, I am going to become an aficionado of sardines, even if I would never eat them back home. And I'm really going to enjoy that. That's part of my trip, part of my experience. Be willing to try anything, even if it's mysterious or strange. I have a, an ethic. I'm willing to try anything once. Uh, if I don't like it, that's fine. I might discover that I love it. If not, that's okay too. Uh, for example, I was driving through the mountains of Slovenia with a Slovenian friend of mine, and he pulled over the car and he said, this farmhouse, I think, has kišlo mlieko. I want to make sure you get to try this. It's so important to me. So we went into the farmhouse, and we sat down to the table, and they brought me a dish of kišlo mlieko, which is basically looks sort of like a yogurt with a yellow film on top. Uh, so I thought, geez, I trust my friend. I'll give it a try. I took my spoon, and I kind of broke through the film on top and discovered kind of a creamy yogurt below. And I lifted it to my mouth, and I got a taste of kind of a, a really tart yogurt with sort of a barnyard aftertaste. <laughs> and only then did my friend say, ah, yes, kishlomeko, it's the best. The translation is soured milk. Uh, this is a tradition where they put unpasteurized yogurt, basically, in the barn for a few days to let it pick up the flavors of the farm. I'm not saying I get a craving for soured milk every time I'm in Slovenia, but it was a great memory. Even if you don't enjoy the food, you're creating a great memory. If you're in Scotland, try the haggis. Give it a try. Here's a challenge. If you're in Florence and you want a quick bite, you could just go to a pizza window. There's millions of those around Florence. Or you could eat what the Florentines eat. You could have a tripe sandwich. Uh, there are several little kiosks all around Florence, including one at the Mercato Nuovo, which is a beautiful historic market hall right in the center of town. Uh, and it's a little bit hard to get your head around the fact that you're eating tripe, but once you get past it, they dip it in a delicious sauce, and it's really fantastic. And if that's not good enough for you, you can think, Michelangelo ate this same tripe sandwich. And I'm not joking. His workshop was right around the corner. 500 years ago, he came to probably right about here and ordered basically the same thing that I just had. Uh, my point, don't be afraid to try scary or unusual foods. The other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of Europe is, in addition to all of these sort of foodie concepts historically that have come from Europe, a lot of the most cutting edge trends in recent culinary thinking have come from Europe as well. And if you really are into food, it's fun to get to know where some of these things come from that are becoming very popular even now with American chefs. Uh, for example, deconstructivism uh, was basically started by a, a, a Catalan chef in the region around Barcelona named Ferran Adria. Uh, he had a very famous restaurant called El Bulli. Uh, and he figured out ways to basically use science to bring out a whole new level of, of sophistication to food. Uh, sometimes this is called uh, molecular gastronomy or modernist cooking. Those are kind of related fields. The best example uh, that Fernand Adria came up with is the liquid uh, olive. I went to one of his restaurants in Barcelona recently, and they brought this to you, and it really looks like an olive. You think, oh, it's just an olive. When you bite into it, what you discover is it's a thin gelatinous layer surrounding an extremely powerful essence of olive that he's distilled from actual olives. And this is sort of the thinking behind deconstructivism. It's taking the component parts of food apart, uh, doing different things with them, uh, becoming a little bit experimental and scientific with how you deal with them, and coming up with a food that sort of resembles the original food but is a completely different experience. Uh, at a similar restaurant, also by uh, Ferran Adria, I had this delicious cheesecake, which was shaped like a little wheel of cheese 
but you could actually take that cookie and dip it right down into the middle of that. And when you tasted it, it tasted like a great cheesecake. This is a really fun thing that started in that part of Spain and spread quickly over Europe and now is very popular, of course, stateside among big name chefs. Another school of thinking that started in Europe that's become popular in a lot of other places is New Nordic. Uh, this was uh, invented by René Redzepi, who has a very famous restaurant in Copenhagen called Noma. And basically, it, it's not being afraid of modern technique, some of the things I just talked about, but also being really careful to root your food very much in the place where it, it originates. He wants to kind of evoke traditional foods, even if the presentation looks very modern. And in the case of René Redzepi, he does a lot of uh, his uh, ingredient sourcing simply by foraging. He'll go out to the beaches around Copenhagen, and most of what you see on the plate is something that he was able to source right there in the city of Copenhagen. Um, this is something, again, that's catching on stateside as well. Now, talking about all of these big name chefs, you might think, geez, this sounds way out of my budget. Uh, but one of the things I really want to emphasize is that foodie doesn't have to mean expensive. I am somebody who uh, really appreciates being on a budget. I'm a really thrifty person. And some of my favorite food experiences in Europe have come uh, with a very small price tag. Uh, for example, this street corner in Naples. Naples, of course, is the birthplace of pizza. And it's this grubby little corner of the city and there's traffic pushing by you and it's actually hard to get to it. But you might see right here, there's a little window where they're selling pizza. And if you go up to that window, you can get the most delicious pizza that you've ever had uh, for $5 uh, in the birthplace of pizza in the place where it came from. Uh, one day I went there and the line was too long for the pizza and I thought, well, I just need to grab a quick bite. So I ordered an arancino for less than a dollar. And this is basically a deep fried ball of rice and mozzarella cheese and ragu and peas, and they dip it in the deep fryer. It's one of the most delicious things I ever had, and it cost me less than a dollar. Um, so don't think that you can't be a foodie if you're on a tight budget. Um, in fact, it's kind of a fun challenge, and I'll have some more ideas about that later on. One of my favorite restaurants in Poland, a country that I've been to a lot, is a little no-name hole in the wall. You have to literally walk past a big glitzy pizzeria down an alley to find it. You step inside, and I've had the best Polish food I've had anywhere in this little out-of-the-way restaurant. Uh, for less than $5 for the complete meal. So just because you are on a tight budget doesn't mean you can't be a foodie.